So thank you all for coming um, and for attending the session for Energy Catalyst and Environment and Theo uh, Charles Tamatatos, uh, the chair of this session. We started uh, uh, with the, the presentation uh, by Professor Neck from the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. The title of his presentation is Towards Holistic Understanding of Electrochemical Energy Conversion and Storage Systems Using High Energy X rays. Uh, Professor Neck, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, do you hear me? Well, Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so uh, so what I'm going to present is uh, touching the energy research we're doing at uh, ESRF uh, in general, and I will mainly focus on the elastic scattering and using high energy uh, photons to, to look inside electrochemical devices used for energy conversion and storage. So why we are studying like, uh, this kind of devices, it's, it's very clear. So um, there is a push to, for various reasons to move from the fossil fuels into more, more uh, uh, sustainable solutions. And for this, we will need to store the energy to convert it into the chemicals. The chemicals uh, as form of hydrogen, for example, can be used in industry or be stored and later converted back to electricity. So uh, from that sense, we need to develop as a society these schemes where we can actually uh, uh, store the, the energy. And this is the, the focus of, of large part of research at ESRF. So what is the electrochemical device? So this, we are looking at the lithium ion battery sketch of it. So on the left side here, you can, uh, I'm not sure if you see the, the mouse, but maybe. So you can see the, the blue side, it's the anode. So this is where we uh, zoom the lithium in. So which is more or less in the metallic state. So the electrons have very high energy. And then we dissociate the electrons from the, 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 the lithium. And then we move the electrons through an external circuit. The lithium as a, in ionic forms move through the battery, through the electrolyte. And then it oxidizes uh, at, at the other, at, at the cathode. So, and, and there you take the, the electrons, which now have very low energy. And the difference between the energy of the electrons give you the, the, the potential and the power. So that's the general idea. So you have two electrodes and in between you have electrolyte. The same thing is true for uh, fuel cells. For example, in this case, hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen electrolyzers where instead of using lithium as an active material or a fuel, you use uh, hydrogen, which is uh, easier to handle and store. And uh, you strip it of, of electrons, you move the hydrogen ions through the ionomer. And on the other side, you, you combine it with oxygen to make water. So those kind of solutions are good. They both are good for something else. So uh, battery is good for short-term storage. Uh, uh, even in large scale, though, uh, and, uh, fuel and hydrogen would be better for, for a long term storage to, to offset, let's say, the, the natural gas. Use. So uh, where the research goes in this kind of devices, it's mainly into the materials because it's very complicated heterogeneous system. So everything it uh, comes from nature. And as we try to uh, mimic the, the nature, we make these complicated schemes and, and uh, materials which work at different uh, scales. So materials and engineering issues are uh, limiting the performance typically, and we have to study them in the real environment uh, because all the materials at the end work together. So we have to assemble the, the battery and to understand where the limitations we have to study it occur under an in situ. So this is the multi-scale problem, as I said. So, uh, so you have to understand the atomic scale of the material all the way. So in, at the top part, we see the typical fuel cell problem. So we have to understand the surface of the catalyst, how to put it into the catalyst layer, ionomer in the MEA, and then make a stack. The same is true for the batteries. We have to understand the lithiation, the insertion of the alkali metals into the materials then how the, the, the ion moves through the battery, 
and all the way how to make a battery and stacks and how to put it in the car. So ESRF beamlines are uh, very well equipped for this task. Uh, and I would say this is one of the best tools you can use because we can span all the scales you need for the research into the energy conversion devices. Uh, and we can use various instruments. So here is the list uh, roughly uh, with the scales which we use and which are being heavily um, employed at ESRF for this kind of research. I'll be mainly talking about the ID31. This is the beamline where I work. So we use high energy X-rays. What is the advantage? The advantage is that you can look inside. So if you study these devices, you, you are talking about looking in the buried interfaces and buried materials in some casing. So you have to cross lots of uh, uh, casing materials and plastic and stainless steel before you actually reach the active materials inside the battery. So high energy has really uh, uh, good penetrating power. Uh, then if, if we talk about the diffraction and scattering, you actually uh, squeeze the reciprocal space. So that means that you can uh, monitor many more diffraction peaks at the same time which is very nice and handy because typically you see all the materials at the same time. So, so more of the peaks you see, better refinement you can do. And you always, with the higher energy, induce lower damage because the scattering power for the elastic scattering compared to the, the absorption, which is uh, related to damage, uh, goes up with the energy. So, so those are advantages. How we typically do this? So we have different instrument or you have more universal instrument, the ID31, for example, where we can, uh, some of the techniques which are here shown, we can combine together to look into inside of these electrochemical devices. But then you can move, of course, uh, from one instrument to the other, take the, we are now moving into the, the, the same sample environment on multiple demands. So you can characterize uh, your samples and, and your batteries and multiple demands using the same, same uh, hardware. So we typically, for the elastic scattering, we use XRD. Uh, <clears throat> so there, of course, because we have large uh, chunk of reciprocal space, which we measure, then we see many peaks. And many peaks means that you can do much more precise analysis, which is very handy because then you can uh, really distinguish much more details than you are able to do with the lab source. Uh, not uh, beside that we can measure really fast. So one diffraction pattern we can get in a matter of milliseconds. So that's very nice. <clears throat> then we can do something, uh, we can look also on amorphous materials with elastic scattering. So this is called uh, per distribution function. So some of the materials in, in the, the batteries and fuel cells and other energy conversion storage devices are amorphous. So before, because we take uh, advantage again of the large reciprocal space, which we can sense, and this allows us to do the Fourier transform and get the the interatomic distances, which is already uh, very good. And then we use uh, often a small angle scattering. So now we are moving from the scales of atoms to the scales of uh, tens and hundreds of nanometers, which really defines the morphology. And that's very important in the, in the materials which are used for the diffusion. So electrolytes uh, and even the electrodes where, the, the, where we need to study the diffusion behavior of the ions. So those are the main uh, kind of techniques, which we can then combine into the imaging. So which is, which we call, uh, let's say, uh, scattering, uh, computed tomography. You can do this with the XRD, you can do this with the SATs, you can do it with the PDF, it doesn't matter. You take a pencil beam and you uh, scan your beam through your sample while you also turning the sample azimutally and this this is like a normal computed tomography, but each voxel now uh, contains the whole XRD pattern, for example. So then for, for each voxel, it's a kind of 4D data set at this point, or, or, uh, or 5D data set, because you have intensity and the whole XRD. So, so, that's, uh, so you have Q and intensity. So, so that's uh, very nice, very handy, as I'll show you later. This is the... Uh, let's say typical uh, ID31 layout of the beamline. So we have detector, which we can move to various distances to, 
you look at, at different uh, scales in the real space, we use very high energy. We can focus the beam to, to very small uh, numbers. And there are beam lines which can go uh, to tens of nanometers in the focus if needed. Um, and, and we have uh, cadmium telluride detectors, uh, typically, which are able to sense the high energy. So this is the setup that we have mounted fuel cell or other electrochemical cell on the right. And uh, this is the example of, of the battery research we're doing. So this is in collaboration of your colleague from uh, uh, technology department at University of Crete, so Emmanuel Glinos, and with the, with the um, Greek company Sunlight, which are you know, very active in, in this kind of uh, research and development and selling the technologies. So in this case, we're looking at the single ion uh, solid uh, polymer electrolytes, which will be used in the next uh, generation of the batteries, which we call solid state batteries. And the idea from, uh, from uh, Emmanuel and his colleagues is to make really universal approach where you design these polymer materials in, uh, involving these nanoparticles, which we just these core shell structures. And by just tuning few parameters, you can uh, very much uh, tune the, the, the morphology, the, the conductivity, and the elastic uh, properties of the materials, which then makes it useful for different kinds of technology. So we have three different nanoparticles in this case. We uh, put them into the matrix of, uh, of uh, PEO and uh, polymer. And then we study how they assemble together. So you can do, as, as you can see here, so, so nanoparticle A is very big, right? And, and it's uh, very much uh, dispersed in, into the uh, PEO matrix. The nanoparticle C is much smaller. Uh, and it's it's maybe it's not that great visible, but it starts to bun, bunch together and same as nanoparticle B. So and this different size, different shapes really defines the, the the properties of the polymer. So we take them and the, we measure the small angle scattering, and from this we can we get much more understanding of what's going on. There are like red curves inside, which are hard to see, but uh, those are the fits to the theoretical model. And then we can, this, uh, we can determine exactly the, the size of the nanoparticles, how they actually are embedded into the polymer matrix, how the polymer matrix itself is uh, disturbed, and how, uh, how they actually bundle together and, and form these chains. So they're having some kind of structure factor. So, uh, so this is very uh, important for the company and for the researchers to, to understand this kind of behavior. So they can move and, and develop uh, better versions or incorporate it into the full battery. So another example is we are looking at the anode of the typical uh, lithium ion battery, but which involves a silicon as well. So, so here you have the charging curve um, and this charging curve. So in, in blue region, we actually uh, uh, we charge the battery and in the green and yellow region, we discharge it. And then again, we charge it, the material, uh, the carbon material again in the, in the red region. So what you can see now, so this is the diffraction pattern in, uh, in the vertical direction here. And uh, here we see just the, uh, on each plot, we see the different uh, height of the cell. So this is now measured in the real assembled point cell. So, so it's uh, something you, uh, you know, the same geometry of the cell as you put into your cameras, for example. And then we can see that uh, in some regions, for example, when we do the full charge, the position of the peak for the, for the carbon, so for the graphite, is changing. That means that the graphite starts to lithiate. And this is for us the footprint of the lithiation. And this is how we follow the, the state of charge. And in this case, if we measure together the small angle scattering, those are these plots on the right, we can also follow the lithiation state of the silicon. So now we have both information at the same time from the carbon and silicon, which is important because we find out, for example, and I'm going to go into the detail that the silicon charges sooner than the, than the, the carbon. And which is very important when you design this kind of materials to keep that in mind for, for example, volume change. 
So uh, we have the same curve now, and then we do this, what I described before as a scattering tomography. So now we have a 2D slice images of what's happening inside that coin cell, right? So, so the top part is, is what's happening in the carbon. So you can see that the, the carbon is being lithiated. Now different slice means uh, different height of the cell. So the lithiation is very uneven in the cell, like during the height. And it's also very uneven uh, in, the, in the lateral direction. So by the side of the cells, the, the material actually is not lithiating at all. So it's, and the, of course, in, in that case, it's bad for the manufacturing because you're losing lots of uh, material, which is inactive in the cell. The same we can follow with the stacks. And, uh, and again, we can see that, you know, some of the parts which where the carbon is not lithiated, the silicon is actually fully lithiated. So it's much more complicated. We have the, the whole explanation of this, but that's for the discussion later. So that's very nice. So we're now getting into the holistic approach where we look at the full device and we can distinguish very well the chemistry which is going inside at different levels. Um, so this can be pushed further. So now we have real cell real, which is used in the cars by the car manufacturers. So those are these eight millimeter cylindrical cells. Then you have to actually stack them into the bigger stacks, uh, bigger packs. But we take just one cell, which is cylindrical. Uh, and then we uh, do the same uh, diffraction tomography. And you can see the windings here clearly of, of, the, of the, the roll, right? And, uh, and then we can distinguish because for each voxel here in the in the image we have the full diffraction pattern so we can look and zoom on one peak for example and we know oh this is the peak from the iron so we know that the, this is the iron casing and we can keep going and follow the same logic as i showed before that the the lithium uh, the carbon sorry has different lattice parameter different position of the peak depending on the lithiation state so we can follow even in the full device in the battery which goes into the car we can follow this charging and this charging behavior just looking on these uh, on these features the same we can do at the cathode with the with the insertion cathode materials okay so now we can uh, really um, uh, we can unroll the the roll and then you can see that that, for example, LIC6 is fully lithiated, LIC12 is less lithiated, LIC30 is, is not very lithiated. So there are parts of the cells, again, which are um, much less lithiated than the other ones, right? So, of course, close to the separator, it's more lithiated than close to the current collector. But there's also this part, which is not lithiated at all. And this is exactly, I'm going to skip this, where the, the, the anode tap is, right? So now... If you're an engineer and you are trying to make your beautiful material into the cell, you have to also keep in mind that there's other parts in the cell which affects radially, right? So, so uh, it's actually visible here. So affects radially the whole battery, just that you put the aluminum tap, affects the materials, not only just beside the tap, but also, for example, on the other side of the, you know, it's same like if you use the ESRF synchrotron, something happens, on the other side of the ring, it actually affects you as well, right? So similar idea, but but in the battery world, I'm gonna skip this. We can do the same thing with the fuel cells. So this is the, the device which convert, uh, convert hydrogen into the electricity. So we designed this uh, special fuel cell, which we have at the beam line. So you can make your material and you can put it in and measure the behavior. Not sure why it's blue the background. This is how it looks like that. And then we measure different ways. So this is a layered material again, right? So we can, because we have high energy, we can actually go um, uh, parallel to the layers. So, and as we have small beam, we just scan through the material, through the MEA. And we can distinguish, like you can see on the left side here, we can distinguish uh, each part of, of the cell separately. So the, the XRD patterns actually do not overlap. So which is very nice. We can also follow all sorts of stuff. So this, the blue curve here, so this is uh, along the direction of the cell. And the blue curve is, for example, the water. So we can actually distinguish the water content. This is very important because the water defines the, the, the diffusion flux to a large extent into the, the catalyst. 
So you have to write the fine balance. So we can uh, monitor all sorts of stuff. This is the example, what is it good for? For example, so you look at the aging of the catalyst. So what's happening uh, to the platinum catalyst when you put it into the cell and, and run it. And then we, again, we distinguish the size of the nanoparticles from the XRD and size of the nanoparticle from SUCKS. And because each technique sees the size different ways, so XRD sees this as a size of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, just one, uh, one coherent domain, but the SUC sees even the agglomerates as a one object, right? So you can see that at the beginning, the size of the SUCKS here, that's a black curve left top, it goes much higher up than from the XRD. So we know that in that part of the, of the, of the functioning, that the nanoparticles actually agglomerate together. And then they coalesce, right? And then they undergo also ripening. So they kind of dissolve and start growing. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of what example of what it is good for. Then we can do this to uh, this diffraction tomography as well. In this case, we can also measure the SACs, where we can monitor the, the, the humidification of the membrane, which then defines the, the actual ionomer, so the electrolyte behavior. I'm not going to go into the detail. So what's interesting here to see, and this is good uh, you know, from this device science perspective, that you actually age your catalyst. So if you concentrate on the figure E at the bottom, you see these lines. And the, the red color means that the nanoparticles are larger, which means that the that the catalyst aged much more in in these areas than than before. So, how you de de design your your fuel cell, your flow field, uh, really goes down into the atomic le level how the catalyst ages. Right? So, so this is something new and which we still try to understand. So, so. The macro scale really design affects the nanoscale aging, which is surprising and interesting. So conclusions using high energies uh, is advantageous for in situ and operando electrochemical experiments. Uh, we use it uh, in a routine base now, and it's, it's, uh, it's very good. So you can go from the materials uh, kind of level all the way to the device level. So that's nice, of course. We often, I didn't talk about it, Kirill will talk about it much more, that we often also look at it with the absorption spectroscopy. So I just uh, just uh, show you the diffraction part, part, but of course we combine it at different beam lines with uh, different techniques. Uh, what is the next? So by combining the different techniques, different beam lines, we really start to understand holistically how these devices work, which already led to, to certain improvements and uh, prolongment of the life. So now if we are thinking that the, the Europe will uh, invest about uh, 10 billions of euros in the next five years into the hydrogen economy, for example, and, and batteries. So this is important because, you know, if you extend uh, your device lifetime, just 10%, it's, it's a huge saving of the money. Right? And then, of course, we are moving to larger and larger devices because more and more problems arise, but just from the scale of the device. Uh, and then where we are also moving is a true single nano object characterization with coherent beams. And I think that maybe this will be discussed uh, later uh, in the thing. So those are some EBS opportunities for you. So from the scientists from Greeks, if you would like to come so we can do the multi scale of the characterizations, you can get uh, fast 3D visualization, which is not, for example, the scattering tomography in such a speed we're doing here. At, for example, ID 15 A beam line is designed for this kind of experiment. It's very fast, very efficient. So this is uh, very unique around the world, a very unique instrument. We can access the time scale of electron transfers now because we have very high flux. We can couple chemical and microstructural operando measurements. Uh, we can get some particle information we can get smaller and smaller particle with uh, just, just one object characterization with uh, uh, Brax CDI. And we can also simultaneously do low Z and high Z materials in spectroscopic mode uh, with our Raman instrument. And thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have question, I would like to ask if you ask them right now, because I will have to leave in 10 minutes. So thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Bunek, for uh, the beautiful um, presentation. And so, uh, do we have any questions from the audience here? Yes, Professor Viola. Hi, Jacob. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm aware that ID31 is one of the older subscribed bin lines, which means great success. I was wondering what's the percentage of the submitted proposals which request com combined methods, XRD, PDF, computed tomography, and such? Is it a new trend? Uh, so I didn't didn't understand completely. The, the sound is not the great. But uh, how many? So the question was how many proposals uh, are used for the combined investigations? Is that correct? Yeah. So I think that's more than half of the proposals, right? So we typically combine very often the SACs, small angle and wide angle scattering with the tomography. So. Tomography not always, sometimes it's not needed, depending on the system you do, and sometimes it's just simply overkill to do. But the SACS and wax investigation, that's very common. For fuel cells, electrolyzers, batteries, CO2 converters, uh, many times. We also very much work into the metallurgy and additive manufacturing, but that's a little bit different stuff. And uh, if you have more details, I can give it. How many days uh, does a typical experiment like this last? So typically, it depends. The measurement is fast. Depends what you want to do with the with your battery. So if you need to charge it eight hours, discharge it eight hours, then we need some time to prepare the beam line. Let's say six hours, and that's the time you need, right? So the measurement itself is is. Uh, negligible compared to actual time you would like to do the experiment with the electrochemical device because mm -hmm. we can take diffraction pattern very fast so 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 that's it so typically it's like three days but for example we are working also uh, now with the battery hub right which is very advantageous because we set up the beam line for one particular measurement and uh, and the 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 partners in the hub they already pre-select the measurements so they nicely go after each other and we don't need to change the setups we just measure different materials in often in the same electrochemical device we just change the materials right and, and measure many many different materials at the same time so it can be very efficient mm. uh, last point if i may uh, we are running a little bit out of time and I have to transfer one question from the... Yes, sir. From the yes. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Bled from National Hellenic Research Foundation, is it possible to analyze thin films with a pole of your method? Yes, of course. Yeah, this is possible. That's something we do as well. The thin films and surface diffraction experiment, that's about 30% of our... Um, uh, at ID31. That's about 30% of our point. So thin films, pole figures, yes. In the device, you can put it also in, in your battery if you want, or in your um, in your solar cell. I mean, solar cell doesn't make sense, but in your fuel cell electrolyzer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for uh, the nice presentation again. Uh, I hope uh, we see you soon. So please join me to congratulate the speaker and move to the next. So next is uh, Professor Castillo Missel, uh, again from the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. Okay, so thank you uh, for the opportunity. Good afternoon. So my name is Ilan Castillo Michel. I'm a scientist at Beamline ID21 at DSRF. And today I will speak about uh, synchrotron and contributions to agricultural sciences. Um, so, well, uh, my research, uh, the research we do at the Beamline in particular, ID21, but in general at DSRF, which relates to agriculture, has to do with plant and soil sciences mainly. Um, so what we do is, um, for agriculture, it's very important that we maintain an adequate balance between uh, essential elements for, for the plants and their content in the soils and 
the elements that may be potentially that are non-essential and that they have some detrimental effect to even organisms, in this case, to the crops that we are interested. So there is a lot of effort which is done in, into mapping or tracing these elements in the, in the environment, in, in particular in agricultural systems. So there are concentrations and their locations in the, in the soil, but then also in the plants and how uh, plants uh, uptake these elements and where they store them and how they manage them and what are their functions um, in, in the tissues. This is a very important questions we have. So in particular, um, with regarding these essential and non-essential elements, we want to know where they are located and what are this, what is their chemistry, what chemical substance they, they are present in which form. So at ID21, how can we do this? Uh, and the other thing I said yesterday, where you can also do X-ray presence mapping. Uh, we use a micro beam uh, for 0 0.3, 0 0.7 micron size. And we can tune the energy from 10 to a little bit higher than 10 kilo electron volts, which means uh, that we have uh, access to, um, to many elements of the periodic table that we can uh, map, that we can do X-ray presence imaging. And for the elements which we have uh, underlined in the periodic table, these are elements where we can uh, scan their, their binding uh, energies of uh, different K, L, or M. M shells, mainly K and L, L shells. And these uh, scans will give us a spectrum, X-ray absorption spectrum that will help us to identify or to get more information about the chemical environment in, in, the, in the ligands, so oxidation state and, and ligands in the, related to these uh, important elements, nutrients or toxic elements. So more in detail how it is done. Well, we we have a synchrotron source, the ESRF. We use a double crystal monochromator to select the energy. We shine the, the we shine this on the on the sample. We scan the sample uh, at each one of these points. We get a primary X-ray, which uh, is kicking off an electron, and we detect the fluorescence of the the X-rays which are emitted by the relaxation process using uh, solid state detectors. So we get on each one, so say this is your sample, we get on each one of these pixels an X-ray fluorescence spectrum. And in each one of these peaks, we can attribute this to a given element. So in this case, we have titanium, calcium, potassium. Then we can display the titanium signal. And after we can move the beam to a given spot and then scan, in this case, the edge of, uh, of titanium and compare these. Uh, to, to references or use theory to identify the different uh, um, components or uh, isoforms of titanium. In this case, we can distinguish between uh, the, the titanium dioxide, anatase, and rutile, etc. So this this can be applied to to, diff, to the different elements as I was mentioning in the from the periodic table. And uh, I want to make some remarks about the sample preparation because this is very important. So you can follow the typical chemical fixation and embedding in resin, or you can do some drying protocol. But uh, what we, if we are interested in, 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 especially for plants and other kind of living uh, tissues, we prefer to do a craft fixation. For that, we plunge freeze the sample. So we embed it in OCT, we plunge freeze it, and then. Uh, at the beam line, we have a cryomicrotome, so we get slices of these uh, samples, and then we mount them on the cryo stage and we analyze at 100K. Um, okay, so this is more or less what, how they work, uh, and I will present some examples how we do it. So how can we use this X-ray fluorescence and absorption spectroscopy for agricultural sciences to solve some of the main uh, uh, problems we're facing with regards to food security and sustainable agriculture, where um, the main uh, issues we are facing is that we need to produce more and more food, so we need to make agriculture more, more successful and more sustainable. At the same time, we have to use less land or we have to maintain the kind of land that we use for these agricultural activities, and we have to balance our emissions while keeping the produce uh, safe for eating. So I will present uh, three, three examples of how we can, of this research that has been done at ID21 and how this uh, uh, relates to these topics of safety and, uh, and uh, enhancing the 
enabling sustainable agriculture. So the first one is related to uh, the food safety and is related to cadmium in, uh, in cacao. So um, we know that cadmium is, uh, is toxic at very low concentrations. Uh, so in, in humans, it's, it leads to renal dysfunction, osteoporosis, and, and it's a class one carcinogen. So the sources for, the, for humans are through the diet, so from cereals, fish, but also cacao contains significant amounts of uh, cadmium. And so the new legislation is, uh, is uh, stipulating that um, the maximum concentration should be 0.8 milligram per kilogram for dark chocolate uh, and 0.1 for milk chocolate. And uh, the main source or one of the main sources of, of uh, the cacao used uh, in Europe is from South America. And uh, with these new regulations, uh, these, uh, these beans that come from, from South America will not be able to be commercialized in, in Europe uh, because, uh, I'm the because the concentrations are, are higher than these limits. And for that, we have to find a solution because this is um, a big uh, challenge uh, for, for society. For the, so, so it's a big socioeconomical issue. Uh, so there's lots of discussions how we can do uh, better, how we can maintain uh, uh, the uh, continue using the cacao which comes from South America um, and not leave or put all these families out of, uh, of business or source of, of income. So we know about cadmium that uh, soil parameters and the genotypes of the plants and what you do after post harvest is what determines the, the amount of cadmium that you will end up having in the the final product, which is we use for consumption. Uh, but we, we want to know what is the pathway from soil to the grain. Uh, one of the particularities of this, uh, of this uh, issue is that, uh, in fact, these, the soils where there are, these plants are being uh, grown in South America is not that they are contaminated with cadmium, but they just have a little bit of background uh, cadmium concentration, and the plants are very good at, uh, at still uptaking this. So we want to understand the, the, the cadmium localization and the speciation in the plants uh, to, to find uh, and propose some solutions and understanding first how this happens and then how we can mitigate. Uh, about cadmium, we have done over the years many studies on cadmium. Uh, so for example, we know that uh, in, um, in the Arabidopsis plants, we have cadmium binding to oxygen and sulfur ligands. Uh, we also know that other hyperaccumulators like the globe amaranth um, has a, a strong correlation between the, the presence of uh, calcium oxide crystals and, and the binding of cadmium to these oxide crystals. Uh, we have also studied uh, uh, grains like wheat grains and in wheat grains, uh, we, we also find their, their exact location in the, in the crease region of the, of the grains. And we know that also the, 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 the ligands are uh, ma mainly oxygen. Uh, so we have done, we know that uh, singleton techniques uh, are successful are locating cadmium and, and understanding their chemistry. So we know that we can apply this to, to, to the cacao problem. Um, and so the, the experiment goes as it is. Uh, we get some samples from, uh, from uh, land, which is for um, uh, scientific purpose. So we have some, some lands in Trinidad and Tobago where some of the cultivars, uh, which have high cadmium accumulation and low cadmium accumulation are being grown there. And so we know that the, they are taking cadmium in more or less uh, quantities. And the first approach is to investigate in the wood. Um, the first thing is we do a big scan with a, with a non singleton technique, laser ablation. This allows us to see where cadmium is locating and then we can use a high resolution techniques. So here at the level of a one micron resolution at ID21, this is a frozen hydrated, not as in the picture is really a frozen sample, which was transported frozen seen from Trinidad. And now you can see the distribution of cadmium and the strontium, which is a proxy for the calcium oxide crystals. And you can see uh, several spots. Uh, this is suggesting that, as we have seen in, um, in, other, in other plants, cadmium is uh, locating significantly in these oxalate crystals. And we have uh, the X-ray absorption curves that are uh, 
confirming that this is really a binding of cadmium to, to oxalate. Uh, the advantage of doing a desynchrotron is that we have higher resolution and that we can perform this chemical information but through the X-ray absorption spectroscopy technique. But also now, uh, thanks to the to the EBS upgrade and investments in new detectors, we actually are expect, expecting to be able to do the same map we do in laser ablation at the resolution of 30, we can do it at one micron and in more or less the same time. So we can have the same field of view. Um, and uh, this information is uh, very important for us to understand how cadmium is moving through the, through the plant. And on the next stage, because this is a work in progress, we are going to investigate the cacao leaf uh, also to see what happens once uh, cadmium goes further to the in the plant from the from the wood to the leaves and then eventually we will also investigate in the in the beans and try to understand what is the full mechanism and then uh, begin uh, proposing some uh, solutions for for mitigation of this uh, big environmental issue <clears throat> so the the second uh, example also related to to safety is a challenge of nanoplastics in agricultural systems. So we know that uh, we have a big production of plastics and we are using them in many, many, uh, many different fields from packaging, construction, auto automobile industry, electronics, and even in, in, in agriculture, in agriculture is used uh, uh, due to this uh, mulch and greenhouse plastic. So this is uh, the degradation of these polymers is a source of uh, plastics and micro nanoplastics uh, to the soil. We also know that soil is one of the largest plastic sinks in the environment uh, through the use of these plastics in, in, in agricultural systems, but also, you know, it's, uh, just pollu uh, pollution itself, but also application of uh, sludge, uh, um, from wastewater treatment plants, which contain significant amounts of plastics. So at the end, these plastics fragments or microplastics reach the, the soils and then they get uh, degraded to, to nanoplastics. And so we want to understand what is the issue with these nanoplastics? Uh, what is the potential uptake by organisms, in particular plants, but also other organisms that are important for the uh, agricultural systems, whether they can cross cell barriers and if they would have a a potential effect uh, impact on uh, on human health. So this is not an easy uh, thing to do um, because uh, for the techniques that I have presented, so we we don't have really sensitivity for uh, for plastics. But if we what we have done is that we have added uh, develop a polystyrene shell uh, nanoplastic. Uh, size of about 150 nanometers and we have introduced some palladium uh, atoms in, in the plastics. So then by tracking palladium, we can uh, use this as a proxy for the presence of uh, plastics in the, in the tissues. So we exposed uh, wheat uh, plants to, uh, to this palladium uh, nanoplastics at concentrations of 3 and 30 ppm. And as you can see, as the concentration increases using uh, a non-synchrotron technique uh, just for total quantification, we see a dose dependence. So the more plastic you have in the, in the exposure, the more plastic the plant accumulates. But the, the main uh, part is where we do uh, imaging of, uh, of these root tips from wheat um, using X-ray fluorescence again at ID21. And in here you can see we can detect the palladium. Uh, palladium is uh, this is a control plant and they expose to 30 ppm. You see it for, it's forming a kind of a, um, envelope and in particular locating at the root apex. And this may be a potential entry of the, of the nanoplastics into the, into the plants. Then we produce cross sections. Uh, so now these are frozen hydrated cross sections of the wheat. We can see the, the plastic, the palladium uh, proxy for plastic uh, in the outer layer. And we are pushing now the detection and improving the, the preparation and the, and the exposure uh, mechanism to also be able to track inside uh, of the given cells uh, with higher resolution and better detection limits. But the overall, what we have seen is that uh, these uh, palladium of nanoplastics are are very interesting so that we can quantify nanoplastics in, in the plants. We can use them for as model system. Um, we know the nanoplastics, they enter the roots and they are transported even to the air parts of the plants. Um, 
And these nanoplastics also we have seen uh, by combining this with other techniques like uh, computer tomography uh, at the nano and micro scale, uh, that it induces a modification of the cell wall structure, the architecture. So the plant is really responding to this uh, exposure in, in a similar fashion as it will do to other nano particles which are metal based. So. Um, it's, uh, it was very interesting to see what is the effect of nanoplastics in, in the wheat plants. And so we want to move now from more realistic exposure scenarios and be able to detect at lower concentrations, etc. So the third example is related now to fertilization processes. Uh, so in particular, what is concerning nitrogen. Um, nitrogen, we, we obtain it from, uh, so it's abundant in the atmosphere. And so we use industrial processes, the Haber-Bosch process to produce uh, synthetic ammonia, but this is a very energetically expensive uh, procedure. And it also is not very efficient because 50% of the nitrogen that is applied in, in, in the agricultural fields is not actually used by the crops. And so a, a good way to look into this and, and, and try to get more nitrogen and make it more available for the plants is to use, uh, is to look into natural processes. How, uh, in particular, the process of symbiotic nitrogen fixation um, takes nitrogen for the atmos from the atmosphere and, and, and puts it into, into proteins, into molecules that the plants can use. And this is thanks to a symbiosis between uh, rhizobia bacteria and, and leguminous plants, in this case, uh, alfalfa. So you have a new organelle, which is a producer, and this or organelle called nodule uh, has many, many uh, uh, bacteria infecti infecting the cells and producing symbi symbiosomes. And in the symbiosomes, you have expression of nitrogenase uh, enzyme and you get uh, from a, you go from atmospheric nitrogen to to ammonia so this is a way you can also put uh, nitrogen in the soil and and it's maybe more more effective and also more environmentally friendly so we want to understand how this process uh, happens and maybe you can confer this this capability to other plant species etc this is a bit the, the, the final goal so for that, we study uh, the Medica or Truncatura, so alfalfa plants. We produce uh, the nodules. Uh, then the, the nodules are obtained. And again, uh, we cryosection these nodules and scan, scan them with uh, X-rays uh, at ID21. You can see in here distribution of iron, calcium, and potassium. Something interesting to see is uh, these uh, nodules have uh, given sonation, so uh, the meristem, and then there is the SNSN part, and there is also a, a, there is this region here in the center, which is the one which is really active, uh, fixing nitrogen, and so we see uh, a trend of uh, of uh, iron concentration as you are more in the in the active uh, part of uh, of nitrogen uh, fixation. You, we can also zoom in into individual cells. Uh, then in the individual cells, uh, we perform uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, and like this, we can see uh, what is the, um, uh, the the chemical environment of, of iron. Uh, we can do this also in in hyperspectral uh, mode, so in meaning that in by repeating these maps, we can get uh, and change the spectrum in each one of the pixels, so you can get more robust information about the oxidation state. And so with this, we've been working quite quite uh, long, and we have now protocols to understand how iron works in the wild type. But the, the main, uh, the, the next stage is to actually compare this to mutant plants, where we have a hypothesis of several um, proteins that, that participate in the transport uh, or in the reduction oxidation of, of iron. Um, and the delivery from the plant to the nodule. And so by blocking some of them, we can test the hypothesis and understand how this actually works. So this is uh, the next st stage for this, uh, for this project. Two minutes, two minutes please. Yeah. Um, you know, so, uh, so, the, so all this is, uh, can benefit uh, from uh, uh, higher resolution, but also from uh, from bare detection limits. So for that, uh, in particular, IAT21, we are, we are working on a on a new end station, which should be 
uh, soon towards the end of the year or beginning of 2023 available for users and uh, in which we are going to push the limits uh, going down to 100 nanometers we will get so we'll get a smaller beam uh, with the high flux from the EBS and with new detectors, we'll get fast acquisition so we can push to lower detection limits and we are enhancing also our cryopreservation, which is very important, in particular when you're working with these uh, all, all uh, biological samples, but uh, with plants, it's very, it's very important, of course. And uh, yeah, that would, that would be it. I wanted uh, thanks uh, to all the colleagues, so the collaborations for these projects and the ID21 team. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak this afternoon. If not any questions, please join me to thank uh, Professor Missile uh, and um, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker thank you. is uh, Professor Roman Senko, again from the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. Um, Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, not a professor yet, but uh, yeah, hopefully one day. So um, uh, it's my pleasure to speak about uh, the applications of X-ray absorption spectroscopy for uh, for catalysis, and uh, to present uh, some of the ECRF beamlines, those where I work at BM23 and the D24 where I'm responsible for chemistry and uh, catalysis program. And I'm also responsible for the new ID24 DCM beamline that is um, coming online very soon. Uh, so in the beginning, a couple of words about the X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Uh, well, when we uh, deal with new materials, uh, the goal is to understand uh, why they work in such a way, in one way or another. So we need to understand their properties and explain their properties. And the, uh, the, the road, the key to explaining the properties is uh, understanding the structure, because the structure defines the properties. And uh, on this journey, we often ask a lot of uh, chemical questions about the coordination numbers, bond distances, angles, symmetry, oxidation state of particular species. And not only we ask these questions, but we want uh, also, we, we also set some constraints. Uh, so we want answers for these questions uh, for the actual samples, the real world samples that will uh, do the actual job in our battery or in our catalyst. So the, the, the actual materials that's gonna be used. We need the answers in situ and often operando, so not just before and after reaction, for example, but during the chemical reaction, during the charging of the battery. We need these answers with the appropriate time resolution that is characteristic to our process. And uh, quite often we need the element selectivity, so we want to get information on particular atomic species present in our material, and not on the whole material, not on the material as a whole because very often particular species define the, the properties of the material. And the X-ray absorption spectroscopy is a method that can provide uh, answers to at least some of these questions at at least some of these constraints, depending on the, on the problem. So the essence of the method is, uh, is studying the dependence of X-ray absorption coefficient on the energy of incident photons uh right after the x-ray absorption edge of a particular element of particular chemical species this x-ray absorption edges uh, or steps they arise uh, when the energy of the incoming photons becomes sufficient to kick out an electron from a core orbital of a particular atomic species into a unoccupied state so into continuous states and uh, this dependence of the X-ray absorption coefficient on the energy actually can uh, tell us quite a lot about the local atomic and electronic structures, structure of the atomic species of uh, interest. Uh, so the X-ray absorption spectrum, such as the one that is presented here on the picture, 
is usually divided into uh, two parts. The one closer to the edge here in red is uh, called Zanus, it's reabsorption near edge structure, which uh, contains information about the density of unoccupied states of our species of interest and uh, their local geometry and oxidation state. Further away from the edge lies a so-called extended X-ray absorption fine structure, which is basically uh, an oscillatory pattern that is created due to the interference uh, between the outgoing photoelectron wave and the backscattering photoelectron wave, backscattered from the neighbors of our atomic species. And when this pattern uh, is fully transformed, we get something that resembles a radial distribution function. It's not exactly a radial distribution function, but something that is closely related to it. And therefore, it contains information about uh, bond distances, coordination numbers, and uh, disorder in our material. The important things to remember about uh, XAS is that it's element selective technique. So it probes only the species uh, of selected element. And we select the element by selecting the energy in which we measure. So we select an absorption edge, particular absorption edge. So get information only about the species for which we, we measure and their nearest neighbors. Uh, then it's an averaging technique. So we probe all the species of selected element. In case in our, when in our sample, there are several inequivalent positions of particular element or a mixture of oxidation state, well, we will get this mixture in our spectrum because we probe all species of selected element. And then, of course, why we need this method and why we use it quite a lot, and it's getting more and more used uh, in chemistry and catalysis and electrochemistry, that's because uh, the spectra contain electronic and structural information about the, the selected atomic species. As an illustration here, you have the Zanus and exos, free transform exos spectrum of three different copper compounds, copper complexes measured in solution. And uh, these complexes are different because they have a different number of neighbors. The copper has two, four, and six neighbors. And also the average atomic distance between copper and the neighbors uh, these distances are different for all the three complexes. And what we see in Zanus, that the Zanus spectra, copper KH Zanus spectra, for the three compounds are very different. Already it gives an idea that Zanus can be used as a fingerprint method because um, the Zanus spectra, which are basically the, the, the reflection of uh, unoccupied states, they are uh, they depend on the local environment, local symmetry. So different complexes will have different zanes because the geometry is going to be different. And of course, there are some features that are characteristic for particular electronic transitions. So we can, uh, we can track the presence of, for example, here, copper one and copper two compounds, because this is a 1s to 3d transition, which is uh, present in copper two compounds, but absent in copper one compounds. So this is Zanus, and in exafs you see that uh, uh, this Fourier transform of exafs they actually reflect very well the difference in uh, average interatomic distances and the difference in the coordination numbers in uh, of the, of these uh, three compounds. So the compound with uh, the intensity of the main maximum increases with increase of the coordination number and the maximum shifts to higher R uh, concomitantly with the increase of the interatomic distances. So to illustrate uh, in the real case studies, uh, the application of uh, XAS, uh, let's have a look at uh, the first example, which is uh, DENOX catalysis. So the problem is that the diesel cars, which are still there, unfortunately, well, unfortunately or not, but they are still there because we are not uh, using electric cars yet everywhere, especially for heavy duty vehicles. So diesel is still there. 
And one of the nasty emissions from diesel is uh, NOx, so nitrogen oxides, which are very harmful for humans. And uh, the way to deal with them is uh, selective catalytic reduction, which is basically transforming nitrogen oxides with the help of ammonia into harmless uh, nitrogen and water. And a very promising and very good material for this that has recently been commercialized is a small pore zeolite, which is called chabazite, uh, functionalized with copper, so exchange with copper ions. So copper ions sit in the, in the pores of this uh, porous material. Like you, you see the fragment of the framework, chabazite framework here with the copper ions inside, forming some complexes with oxygen and nitrogen and so on. The problem, so everything is fine with this material, but there is an important problem. The problem is that it's, uh, it gets poisoned by sulfur that is present in diesel fuel. So it works very well only with, for fuels with extremely low sulfur concentration. And for the normal sulfur concentration that is usually present in, uh, in diesel, it gets deactivated. So low temperature activity of this catalyst it drops dramatically uh, after several uh, hours or days of exposure to, to concentrated SO2. But concentrated, it means uh, several tens of ppm. Uh, and uh, that means that either you have to change your catalyst very often or or the low temperature activity is down. And low temperature activity is basically when you start your car, the engine is cold and uh, you emit a lot, of, uh, a lot of NOx, which is not good. So uh, currently very hot topic is understanding why actually it gets deactivated and what happens. So what, what is uh, the thing that sulfur is doing to get the catalyst deactivated? And there are many different uh, mechanism proposed for the SCR reaction, selective catalytic reduction reaction. And uh, actually the, what is common in them is that there are many different intermediates of copper formed during the cycle. And uh, our goal was to understand which of these intermediates are susceptible to react with SO2, to react with sulfur. Because those that are vulnerable to SO2, they are most likely those uh, that cause, that, that react and that cause the deactivation of the catalyst. So we created, we synthesized uh, different copper compounds inside the, the zeolitic pores by exposing the zeolite to particular atmospheres and particular temperatures. Different copper uh, complexes with different uh, copper oxidation state, different ligands. And uh, then we measured uh, the NS spectra, the NS and exos spectra uh, before, during, and during the exposure to sulfur. So we start with the blue curve and uh, we expose to sulfur and we see what happens. And you see that for most of them, the changes are quite small. So these uh, compounds react with sulfur not that much. However, there is one, well, actually two, but uh, what, what reacts there, it's, it's one complex. This one, this dimer complex, that reacts quite a lot and, uh, with, uh, with sulfur. And uh, not only it reacts quite a lot, but it is the only thing that reacts. So the consumption of uh, sulfur is huge when this complex is present in the zeolite. So this is the complex that is responsible for uh, absorption of sulfur, absorption of sulfur on the, on the sample. And uh, unfortunately, this complex is the one that is reported to be the key intermediate of the reaction. So it is there and uh, it's, it's this one that gets uh, harmed by sulfur first. And uh, now we know this, because this was previously unknown. Now we know this, and this uh, hopefully will help the industry to develop the catalysts that are less affected by this poisoning. Another example is about the metal organic frameworks. Uh, and this one will be focused more on exhausts. 
So the meta organic frameworks uh, structures with uh, organic linkers and metallic cornerstones that uh, feature high porosity and uh, therefore interesting, interesting for catalysis. And some of the frameworks feature also high temperature stability, like this one, which is called UIO66. And it has zirconium cornerstones. The zirconium is not very redox active material, so it's not, uh, you, you cannot do too much catalysis with it. However, if you substitute some zirconium with cerium, partially or completely, you can uh, use the redox properties of cerium to get some interesting catalytic properties. The thing is that uh, the dependence of the stability of the material on the amount of cerium in the material, so cerium zirconium ratio is not straightforward, and it's not clear why it is like this. And it's not even clear, it wasn't even clear whether when we have a mixture of serum and zirconium in the material, whether we can have the mixture of serum and zirconium in a single cornerstone, like in the picture on the right, or we have a, uh, only pure cornerstones, pure serum and pure zirconium ones. So uh, to answer this question, we did the EXAPS uh, study because EXAPS is very sensitive to the metal-metal scattering here and can discriminate between cerium and zirconium quite easily. And uh, here we zoomed on the metal-metal interaction, the peak that is responsible for metal-metal scattering for the materials with different amount of cerium. And actually you see that all the spectra are different. And cerium KH and zirconium KH, the spectra different cerium loadings are different. And that means that uh, we do have a mixture of cerium and zirconium in a single cornerstone, because otherwise all the spectra would be the same. And not only can we conclude this, but we also can hypothesize just looking at this data. Uh, I don't have much time to, to elaborate, but just looking at this uh, peaks. We can uh, already suppose that we have only three types of different cornerstones present. The pure cerium, pure zirconium, and cerium zirconium-5. And uh, the last one, the cerium zirconium-5, is the one that forms preferentially. And the other two, the pure ones, being formed in order to compensate the stoichiometry, the total stoichiometry. So this was our hypothesis, and it gets confirmed very well by quantitative fitting of the data. Uh, so like this, we, we solved the problem of this exact stoichiometry of the cornerstones and we deduced what actually is being formed on the local scale in our material. Uh, there are many beam lines in, X, in ESRF that uh, can do XAS under very different sources and flavors. So we have uh, ESRF beam lines. We have also collaborative research uh, groups beam lines or national beam lines that can do XAS. Uh, but uh, I will uh, just talk a little bit about our beam lines where I work, BM23 and ID24. And uh, here our large group is uh, focused most on chemistry and extreme conditions. So chemistry is all sorts of chemistry, catalysis, mm -hmm. electrochemistry, and so on under relatively mild conditions. So chemically relevant conditions, industrially relevant conditions. And another part of the group is doing extreme conditions. So this uh, here, the focus is mostly physics and planetary science, and the conditions are much more harsh. So there's hundreds of GPA pressure, thousands of Kelvin uh, temperature. And uh, we can do uh, XAS studies at the time scales from minutes to picoseconds. The two principal beam lines where we do chemistry is BM23 now, and it's gonna be, the other one is gonna be also ID24 DCM that will open soon. So BM23 is a general purpose XAS beam line with uh, excellent stability, wide energy range and possibility, but not the obligation to focus the beam down to several microns. And we use this beam line for relatively slow chemistry where we can measure spectra at uh, in uh, in several minutes, maybe down to one minute. The other beamline, a D24 DCM, will uh, open soon. Actually, in the beginning of uh, next year, in the end of this one, or beginning of the next year. 
And uh, here we will have a very powerful undulator source, a new monochromator developed in ECRF that is expected to be a game changer in spectroscopy thanks to its stability and the possibility to measure exits quite fast. So combining the undulator source and this new monochromator, we'll be able to get a very good exas data uh, in around one second, which will open a perspective for us to do fast chemistry in C2 operando and also combine XAS with different complementary techniques, which we have a lot. So we are quite well equipped with different uh, different instruments for doing uh, also X-ray diffraction, mass spectrometry, uh, UV spectrometry for handling reactive gases, which can be used for in situ experiments. And one of the highlights is the combined uh, infrared uh, and XAS setup. So we have a infrared spectrometer and dedicated uh, cells to measure XAS and infrared spectra. So drifts at the same time on the sample. This is just one example of the studies where we had a look at the evolution of platinum hydrides, platinum nanoparticles. So we were monitoring our sample by mass spectrometry, infrared spectroscopy, and XAS at the same time. And this study made it to the cover ICS catalysis. And this was a work uh, together with the Turin University. Then, uh, as many CERF beamlines, we have a new control software that we are, uh, we, we are very happy about the possibilities that it offers because it's Python-based, so you feel, you feel at home. You can use uh, Python, Python macros, uh, whatever you can do in Python, you now can do it at the beamline. And BM23, ID24, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I'm wrapping up. Uh, we use uh, the automation, so we automate uh, the control of gases, valves, temperatures. You can even get a message on your cell phone in case uh, of a problem at the beam line, or if everything goes well and your macro is finished successfully, you get informed just uh, with, a, with a messenger. And uh, all this uh, makes uh, usually our users very happy. And uh, we produce quite a lot of uh, nice papers. Most of them are in, many of them are in chemistry. And uh, we hope that uh, you will consider applying to BM23 and D24 to do some exciting chemistry together. Thank you for your attention. And if you have some questions, you can ask or just write me a mail. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk and the first thing I'm telling. Uh, so I would be more than happy to ask questions from the speaker from the audience here. I don't see many things moving around in the chat. <laughs> so, um, if we don't have any further questions, please join me to thank the speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lomachenko. Thank you. Thanks. So moving to the next speaker is uh, Professor Tina Kidu uh, from the School of Physics, uh, uh, Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, excellent, uh, Ms. Ponikidou, uh, Professor Ponikidou, can you please uh, tell me if you can hear us? And, I can uh, hear you very clearly. Can you hear me back? Yes, fantastic. Excellent. I'm not a professor. Thank you very much for the title. <laughs> so, I'm Fanny Pinakidou. I'm, I'm going to discuss how we can use X-ray absorption spectroscopies to address certain environmental issues such as the uh, stabilization of uh, industrial wastes and the removal of toxic elements from drinking water. I will begin with a brief introduction on the XAFS phenomenon. So XAFS is based on the photoelectric effect. You have an atom that absorbs uh, energy uh, of X-rays, uh, that absorbs energy E of X-rays uh, destroying a core ele electron that uh, has energy E0 and ejecting a photoelectron with kinetic energy equal to this energy difference. Once the energy of the photoelectron is large enough, enough to promote this photoelectron to the continuum, we detect a sharp increase in the absorption of the atom. 
if, the, if our atom is isolated or free, the absorption coefficient uh, has a sharp step at the core level by the energy E0, which we call the absorption edge, and then simply decreases as a smooth function of energy. However, in the case where we have another atom nearby, the ejected photoelectron scatters from the neighboring atom. The backscatter photoelectron interferes with itself, and the amplitude of the backscatter photoelectron at the absorbing atom will vary with energy. This causes the characteristic oscillations of XAPS. So, the XAPS, uh, so XAPS is basically an interference effect of the photoelectron uh, with itself due to the presence of neighboring atoms. The XAF spectrum breaks down in two regimes. The one that is located close to the absorption edge, it's called NEXAFs or XANAS, while all the rest is simply EXAFs. So to model the EXAF signal, we use what we call the EXAFs equation. The EXAFs equation is simply a sum of sinusoidal waves of modified amplitude due to the presence of neighboring atoms. The main parameters in this formula is the amplitude of the EXAF signal and the phase difference between the absorbing atom and the scatterer. To begin with the fitting, we construct using theoretical calculations, this phase difference, the electron beam free path and the backscattering amplitude of EXAFs. What we can find is the number of neighboring atoms, their distance from the absorber, and the mean square disorder of neighboring distances as these are, these are uh, determined by what, from what we call the bywaller factors. We, we usually work both in the case space and in R space. In R space, we use the Fourier transform of the EXAFS equation, which, is simply, uh, which simply demonstrates uh, the radial distribution of the electronic density around the absorbing atom, which we consider to be at zero. The peaks that appear in the Fourier transform are simply the next, the nearest neighbor cells around the absorbing atom. In this figure, you see the Fourier transform of the X of spectra recorded at the iron K edge of an iron oxide called hematite. In this case, the first peak corresponds to the six oxygen atoms in the iron octahedron, while the rest of the peaks is simply a different number of this octahedra in different configurations. In the case of Xanes, things are a little bit more complicated. We do not have a simple equation to describe Xanes. In this region, the photoelectron, the kinetic energy of the photoelectron uh, is very small. Its wavelength is much shorter than the distances of the neighboring atoms, so multiple scattering effects dominate. However, we can describe Xanes qualitatively and sometimes nearly quantitatively in terms of the bonding geometry of the absorbing atom, the, the type of bonding in molecules, and the band structure in crystalline materials. However, in the case of 3D metals, we can safely state that the XANES is a fingerprint of all the phases present in a material, as this is determined by the oxidation state, the bonding geometry, and the chemical environment around the metal. In the figure on the right, I have plotted the XANES spectra recorded at the chromium K edge of two chromium oxides where chromium has a different bonding coordination and also different oxidation state. As you can clearly see, the, the position of the absorption edge shifts to higher energies when the oxidation state of chromium increases. In the case of uh, the XANES, the, um, the, the, -xanus, uh, the XANUS spectra recorded at the K edge of 3D metals, we detect also this feature approximately 10 EV below the absorption edge. The characteristics of this pre edge peak are strongly modulated by both the oxidation state of the metal and also its coordination. For example, as you can see here in the case where we have trivalent chromium in octahedral, si in octahedral coordination, this pre edge peak is very broad and has low intensity. On the contrary, when uh, chromium is hexavalent and tetrahedrally coordinated, this peak is sharp and very intense. The first type of materials I would discuss are solid materials that, that are produced by the solidification of uh, sludges in oil industry. This sludge is very rich in both iron and lead and accumulates in the storage tanks of oil industry. The first step is to incinerate the sludge in order to create what we call a fly ash. 
And next, we mix these fly ash with appropriate quantities of uh, vitrifying and flux agents, melt it at high temperature, followed by, followed by fast quenching in order to produce solid materials. Depending on the waste content, we can either have glassy or glass ceramic products. The first set of uh, samples investigated are uh, glassy materials that contain up to 60 percent of waste. We were interested uh, in investigating, investigating what is the structural role of iron and lead in these materials. So initially, we um, we started by recording X of spectra at the iron K edge, the Fourier transform of which you see in this figure. As you can clearly see, we detect only one peak, and this is characteristic of an amorphous environment around iron. The fitting analysis results of this spectra reveal that both the iron oxygen and the coordination bond length and the coordination number systematically decreases as a function of the waste content. These values have intermediate uh, values between the extreme for octahedral and the trahedral coordination of iron. So the question that arises is whether iron is a glass former or a modifier in these products. To answer this question, we fitted the, uh, the spectra again by separating distinguishing between the two different configurations of iron in tetrahedral and octahedral sites in our fitting model. As you can see in this figure, as the waste content increases, the contribution of octahedrally coordinated iron decreases. So indeed, by using this fitting model, we were able to uh, find that when the waste content is up to 40% in our glasses, iron is an intermediate oxide. For higher waste uh, concentrations, iron is always a glass formal along with silica. So how about lead? Does it also assist in the formation of the silica matrix? The answer is yes, as it is revealed by the analysis of the XF spectra recorded at the lead L3 edge. Again, as you can see, we detect only one peak in the Fourier transform, which is characteristic of an amorphous environment around the lead as well. The fitting analysis results demonstrate that we have led in all of our cases in trigonal or uh, tetragonal pyramids, which means that lead is an intermediate oxide in all of our products. So we conclude that these materials are safe for the stabilization of the waste. They were able to uh, uh, trap both iron and lead in their glassy matrix, while both of these metals assist in the formation of the vitreous network. Now, when we tried to stabilize a higher amount of waste content, we ended up uh, with what we call uh, vitroceramic materials. Vitroceramic materials are basically glasses that have microcrystalline inclusions. In order to uh, investigate the distribution of iron in such materials, we used capillary optics that reduced the beam size down to five micrometers, and we recorded micro XRFs maps uh, two characteristics of which you see on the left. Uh, we detect um, needle-like iron-rich formations and also iron-rich islands in two vitroceramic materials that contain 65 and 70 weighty percent of waste. Vitroceramics are preferred compared to their uh, classic counterparts because they exhibit uh, uh, enhanced mechanical properties. Another way uh, to produce vitroceramics is to use a glassy sample and subject it to thermal annealing. This is the case you see on the right, where we had a glassy stabilized material containing 60 percent of waste, and we uh, annealed it at 600 and 800 uh, degrees Celsius. Again, we detect regions with high iron content and low iron content. So we were interested in investigating um, what is the effect of this inhomogeneous distribution of iron on its bonding environment. For this reasons, uh, for this reason, we recorded XAF spectra from different spots of the material. On the left, you see the uh, iron cake sun spectra recorded from these need-like iron-rich regions and from the iron-depleted regions. 
you can clearly see that both the structure above the absorption uh, edge, as well as the profile of the pre-edge peak are completely different in the two regions. In these regions, we detect only iron-3, but the environment is different, uh, is completely different. In the uh, microcrystalline inclusions, iron is octahedrally coordinated, while in the iron-depleted regions, iron forms the trider. In order to, um, uh, to find what is the phases uh, in these two, what is the phase of iron in these two regions, we recorded X subspectra, and the analysis result, oops, sorry, revealed that the iron depleted region is glassy. In this region, iron participates in the formation of the glassy matrix and acts as a glass former. On the contrary, these microcrystalline inclusions belong to this mixed lead and iron phase called magnetoplumbite. Upon removing the capillary optics and uh, recording uh, XAFs, uh, XAFs spectra uh, with a conventional beam, we were able to determine that this material is approximately 80% glassy. Uh, this material is able to um, successfully mobilize both iron and lead because we find that iron and lead belong to the glassy matrix as well as to these microcrystalline magnetoplumbite inclusions. The second issue to address is uh, the retention, the immob immobilization of toxic elements from uh, drinking water. Most toxic elements like chromium and arsenide in groundwater, uh, methane groundwater, occur uh, for natural reasons. However, their presence in drinking water is attributed to either natural causes like the oxidation uh, due to the contact of water with soils or to anthropogenic activities like industrial wastes. So certain evalu evaluation criteria should be met in drinking water technology. This includes the ability to keep the concentration of the toxic elements as low as possible, their uh, feasibility to be fully scalable, uh, their low uh, running and capital cost, and also the ability to preserve the physical and chemical characteristics of water. So the idea was to use metal oxyhydroxides for the absorption of uh, such toxic elements because they combine excellent reductive or oxidizing ability and absorption uh, efficiency. Uh, the roots of sorption of elements on surface are two, physisorption and chemisorption. In physisorption, uh, uh, an atom interacts with the surface of the material uh, via van der Waal forces. In chemisorption, we have the formation of what we call inner sphere complexes. In this case, case the atom creates bonds and share oxygen atoms with the uh, surface of the adsorbent. Initially, we were in, uh, interested in uh, investigating how we can uh, remove chromium-6 from drinking water. Here we used magnetite nanoparticles because they exhibit excellent uh, reduc reductive and uh, ability. The, the presence of divalent iron in magnetite can, uh, ox can reduce chromium-6 to the safe uh, chromium-3 species and also possesses a very highly pos positively charged surface area for sorption. We were interested in uh, investigating both the uh, structure of the adsorbent and, and the adsorbate. So we started by recording Xana spectra at the iron KH in a series of materials that were loaded with a different amount of chromium. The pre-edge peak is detected in all of our uh, spectra. We fitted this region using three functions that correspond to different bonding geometry of iron and also to different valence of iron. And using the area under the pre this pre-edge peak, we were able to find the amount of trivalent iron in our samples. Unfortunately, we find that as the loading of chromium in our material, materials increases, the number of uh, divalent iron available for the reduction of uh, chromium-6 six, six decreases. This is attributed to the uh, surface oxidation of magnetite 
to Makhamite. However, this oxidation could possibly create new sites, vacancies, for a further chromium uptake. So in order to see what happens with chromium, we recorded also Xana spectra at the chromium KH. Again, we detect this pH peak in the Xana spectra of all of our samples. However, as you can see, the intensity of this peak changes as a function of the chromium content. Again, using two functions that's, uh, that represent chromium in different configurations and oxidation states, we were able to determine the amount of hexavalent chromium. To our disappointment, we find that even at the lowest chromium loading, chromium-6 remains unreacted. However, this was not a problem as the analysis of the EXAFs uh, uh, spectra recorded at the chromium k uh, demonstrated. Indeed, fitting the EXAF spectra using the XANAS, the previously, uh, the XANAS results I previously showed you, revealed that we have chromium-3 that creates inner sphere uh, complexes. That means it is chemisorbed to the surface of the material, while chromium, uh, the unreactive uh, hexavalent, hexavalent chromium um, is physisorbed. The number of these outer uh, spheres increases as a function of the waste content. So why is the reduction ability of the material uh, why the uh, reductive ability of the material reduces as a function of the chromium content. This is explained by the oxid surface oxidation of magnetite. Upon electron donation of uh, magnetite in order to reduce chromium-6, we have the formation of voids, vacancies at the surface of the material. However, these voids are filled by the resulting chromium-3 species, inhibiting in this way chromium-6 to approach equivalent iron and magnetite so as to be uh, reduced. The next um, uh, issue to address was to find a material that can successfully uh, immobilize both arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 met uh, in drinking water. Here, the idea was to use a mixed iron manganese oxide because the presence of manganese, the travelant manganese, oxidizes the toxic arsenic-3 to the safe arsenic-5, which is very mobile and can uh, easily sorb on the surface of materials. So we started by comparing the um, oxida oxidation and um, sorption ability of a simple iron oxide hydroxide with a mixed iron manganese oxyhydroxide. Uh, to address this issue, we recorded XAF spectra at the arsenic LEDs. In the inset, you see the XAN spectra, uh, the XAN spectra, comparing the profile uh, of the sample that contained only arsenide with the one that contained, uh, uh, sorry, that contained iron with the one that contained both uh, iron and manganese, you can clearly see that the, the, uh, that uh, differences exist. In the case when we have only iron, arsenic-3 remains unaffected. However, when we use incorporate manganese, all arsenic-3 is transformed to arsenic-5 as the shift of the characteristic white line in the spectra demonstrates. However, sorry? You have two minutes left. Yeah, yeah, it's the last slide. Thank you. However, the EXAFS analysis resulted that the arsenic L3 edge revealed that both of our species are safely sorbed on the surface of the material. Uh, ars both arsenic 3 and arsenic 5 form inner sphere complexes in this geometry. So we use this material by uh, in order to see if changing the amount of manganese can affect the sorption ability of the material. Again, we used XAFS measurements at the arsenic L3 edge, and as you can see in the inset, all of our uh, arsenic-3 species were transformed to arsenic-5. In this case, the, the sorption mechanism is different from the previous one because we found by the analysis of the EXAPS uh, spectra that arsenic-5 is now uh, involved in two different geometries in the inner sphere, uh, uh, in the inner sphere sorption. So 
I hope that I have convinced you that such spectroscopies can enlighten on a number of, of environmental issues like the management of solid industrial waste or the removal mechanism of toxic elements in soil and in water. Their non-destructive character, character and their non-destructive and atom selective character can find many applications in industry. Uh, XAPs can provide details on the nanoscale that cannot be addressed using other characterization techniques, like, for example, uh, give information on the structure of amorphous materials like the glasses I have just showed you. We can investigate the element, elemental distribution with micrometric resolution and study the impact of this varying concentration on the local bonding environment of the elements under question. We can determine precisely the retention mechanism during removal of toxic elements, as this is addressed by the chemical stability of waste rich products or the sorption efficiency in water treatment technologies. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Finekido, for the very interesting talk. Um, the usual process, the protocol, any questions from uh, <coughs> From the audience here with the physical presence. Let me check again the chat. And just, there are no questions in the chat or the QAs as well. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, so let's move to the next speaker. So the next uh, speaker is uh, Professor uh, Konstantinos Tubos uh, from the Department of Material Science and Technology, University of Crete. Uh, he's going to talk about the solid state chemistry through the prism of synchrotron radiation case studies in the field of high performance halide perovskite semiconductors. Professor Stubos, you have 20 minutes for your talk. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. And uh, for today's, can you see my screen, first of all? I'm not sure if everything is all right. I cannot see anything. <laughs> can you please everything confirm? Is good. Everything is good, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, for today's talk, uh, I will just. Uh, try to be an experimentalist once again. And uh, I will uh, try to narrate uh, my experience with uh, synchrotron radiation in the United States. Of course, I'm very new to the European research. And uh, most of the results I'm going to discuss uh, have been performed in the Argonne National Arbor Laboratory in the advanced for the source facilities. And uh, I will try to uh, briefly describe uh, the, the story of evolution and how synchrotron radiation is so important for developing new materials, and uh, I will focus on halide perovskite. Uh, first of all, I would like to give you a, a, a brief idea about what are the halide perovskites and uh, why they are important. Halide perovskites are uh, semiconductors, high-performance semiconductors that uh, operate in the visible uh, region of the spectrum. They have uh, band gaps in the visible range between 400 nanometers and uh, 700 nanometers, you can see here. And with these materials, you can make crystals, thin films, and uh, also nanocrystals. So you can uh, do anything you could do with a classical semiconductor. And uh, basically, what makes uh, halide perovskite so, so very special is this chart here. You can see that uh, since 2012, uh, people uh, started working with uh, halide perovskites as an absorber in photovoltaics. And uh, starting from something like 12% uh, back in 2012, uh, today we have reached uh, performer research has evolved and the performances right now are in the order of 25% uh, reaching more or less the efficiency that one can obtain uh, using the silicon solar cells. Uh, so this single-handedly dri has driven the field from the beginning for photovoltaics. But uh, from my point of view, the interest is in the 
the structural features and how these structural features can control the properties or how can we design better semiconducting properties and uh, here the story starts first of all i would like to introduce the crystal structure uh, the crystal structure consists of a metal divalent metal in this case surrounded by six uh, halogen atoms and uh, these octahedra are connected in three directions forming uh, infinite uh, polymeric materials and in the voids of these channels uh, of this uh, of this octahedra forming by this connectivity you can find uh, a side cations non-bonding cations uh, that uh, uh, have a charge of plus one so this uh, the whole crystal structure is an ionic structure form uh, consisting of an anionic metal halogen lattice and uh, the, and the positive cations in the cavities and uh, while in oxides the the, the perovskite structures in uh, oxide perovskites is ubiquitous i mean there are so many examples that you can name in halide perovskite there's a problem and the problem is that uh, there are three and only three cations on the that can fit on the a side in this in this cavity to, to stabilize the structure these are cesium methyl ammonium and formamidine and uh, the reason for this is simply geometric so there is so much uh, space in the cavity to hold the cation and uh, there is this very very fine uh, region defined by this tolerance factor a geometric uh, feature uh, connecting the ionic radii uh, related to the ionic radii of the participating uh, ions and you need to hit it to, to have it in this very very narrow region otherwise you get one dimensional structures if it's very small uh, the structure collapses also if it's very big the structure collapses opens up again blows up this explodes i would say and uh, of course there is a very very uh, intensive research on getting more perovskites because we would like to have more possibilities to exploit the properties of these materials and uh, here is a brief overview of what has happened when people have tried to get more than these three cations I was uh, talking about. Uh, you can get uh, perovskite-like structure that can be the hexagonal polytypes, like this direction here, uh, or you can decrease the dimension of the lattice to, from three dimensions to two to one by incorporating bigger cations that have features that um, resemble the perovskite in the sense that they have the, this corner sharing connectivity, the octahedral connected to the corners. And uh, of course, another very, very important feature of the perovskite is that they can undergo through a number of structural phase transition, which uh, tends to reduce the symmetry. And this is explained by the fact that there is a single ion connector, connection, which can easily bend with temperature and uh, give a rise to lower symmetry crystal structures. And uh, why this is important? The importance comes from the basically orbit, the basic orbital overlap that happens. So we know that the maximum orbital overlap comes from the straight uh, angle uh, connection. Uh, we have like a, a, we have a much uh, better ionic uh, electronic properties when we have a perfect connection. The electron can flow through. The dispersion of the band structure is uh, favorable for uh, optoelectronic devices. And we can also tune the band gap, and you can see here the trend, how, how the trend, the band gap uh, changes as we can increase the, uh, as we can, as we do change the, the, the angle that the octahedra are connected in the extended structure. And these are the, basically the, the band gaps, the absorption spectra for the three cations responsible for the uh, photovoltaics, uh, formamidinium with red, methyl ammonium uh, with black, and cesium with blue. Uh, with decreasing order of uh, 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 bending angle. So how do we get about studying these materials? This is, this is what I would like to do uh, in this talk. And I will start giving specific examples of how we address the structures, how we identify temperatures. Uh, first of all, is we would like to identify where these phase transitions happen. And uh, I would like to share this uh, figure, which comes from one of the, my, my first uh, excursions to the synchrotron back in, I think, 2012, I believe. And where we started doing the temperature dependent measurements because we would like to grow crystals uh, at higher temperatures. We would like to grow crystals from the melt. And this is one example of what happens. Uh, we have a material 
that we synthesize by solution chemistry, we get like something, lots of grams that we can use for the, for the, for the growth experiments. And uh, the problem with this specific material is that at some point it melts and uh, it's a, sorry, before the, this material, before it melts, it changes its crystal structure from a yellow non-perovskitic phase to a perovskitic phase. And the very interesting part in this kind of experiment was that when we're cooling down, we didn't return to the original phase. We get, we stayed in the, within the perovskitic phase. And that was important because we were able to get a, a perovskite material for a non-perovskite material. Unfortunately, this uh, this material is only stable for a, a couple of days and it goes back to this uh, original structure. But this is something that was very interesting and helped us understand how the how we can grow the crystals and try to keep it as a perovskite uh, for, a, for a longer time. This has been actually achieved last year, I believe. And uh, there is a lot of uh, understanding from this type of experiment going forward. And of course, we can also do the study the phase transition with pressure. And uh, these are actually very interesting experiment. Uh, you can uh, pressurize the material and uh, make it a, to an amorphous state. And then when you release the pressure, it comes back. So it's very fully reversible process. All these phase transitions are reversible. This is probably an, ex an exception. But eventually, you can get, you get back to the thermodynamic state. Um, what we can also do if we monitor very carefully the phase transition across the phase transition, we can identify if the transition is first uh, first order or second order, if it's instantaneous or not. Uh, here we can see that both the transitions that happen around 160 Kelvin and the one happening uh, approximately at 320 Kelvin are uh, uh, contain both phases at the same time. So that's already gives an idea about the mechanism of the transition. And uh, we can go about, before I move on, we can go about looking at phase transition for all types of perovskites. And this has been done. But uh, I would like to uh, stress here that uh, this is a fantastic tool to understand crystal structures and how they evolve. And the second uh, study is that using synchrotron radiation, we have been able to identify uh, complex materials, their morphology, and how we can grow them in films. And films are very important because thin films is a technology that is used in solar cells or other optoelectronic devices. So we want to understand how the material sits on the surface of the film. So first of all, we synthesize the materials. As I was saying, there are very limited amount of perovskites uh, that we can get in the three-dimensional structure, but there are so many uh, materials that we can, um, uh, we can grow by using a molecular scissors like butyl ammonium here, where you can slice uh, the three-dimensional lattice into thinner uh, fragments, nanometer size fragments. And we can change the nature of the material, the color, the optical properties. We actually are in position to make uh, quantum wells, uh, crystalline quantum wells. And uh, in order to characterize these materials, we have to use synchrotron radiation to be able to identify, uh, this is simple uh, powder diffraction, but high resolution one. And we have been able to identify that we can get the whole set of this series. And by, by set, I mean that we can increase the N number. Imagine that the N number represent a single layer. Uh, so for example, this figure shows the N equals two. So that means that there are two lead uh, halogen layers, one on top of the other, separated by the organic space. Okay. So the, the, the thicker you grow the layers, uh, the larger the solar the, the unit cell becomes. And we have been able to get to grow up to seven layers thick. The record, I think this is the record for the halogen perovskites. Although you can see that when you go to very thick layers, what happens is uh, you lose uh, uh, purity, phase purity. And, uh, but we can clearly see what, what's going on when we go to the thicker layers or when we try to synthesize this material. What happens, we, we do synthesize these materials, but the problem is that we are stuck with a little bit of impurity of the three-dimensional material. So we are playing with very fine thermodynamical uh, limits here. But uh, it, the proof is, this is a clearly a proof using the synchronization that we can actually synthesize these materials. And uh, the original study was 
our uh, for looking at this material was to because we wanted to uh, use them for solar cells. For solar cells, we wanted to do that because you have butylamine, which is in general is a good uh, shield against water uh, to protect the material, make them more stable. But uh, as we we're trying to do that, we we found out something that was very interesting. Actually, when you when you have like a thin layer two-dimensional perovskite, what you actually get is an orientation where the layers lay flat on the on the substrate. Uh, and we can do this for three-dimensional perovskite using special uh, additives like chlorine, and you can get preferential orientation. But the, the very interesting part is that when you go thicker on the film, the, the tendency of the layers to sit flat on the substrate changes. And when you grow the perovskite thick enough, what happens is the layer sits perpendicular to the glass, which was very, very weird as an, uh, as an example, but it is clearly verified by the laboratory experiments, uh, the laboratory, uh, laboratory X-ray diffraction experiments. And then we want to, show, to see in real time what happens in the films. So we did the GWAX and using different uh, techniques, using different conditions and parameters, we have been able to optimize uh, this, uh, the, the, the fill fabrication conditions. So now uh, the perovskite sits perpendicular uh, to, the, to the film substrate and also grows larger crystals. And from doing this, using this hot casting technique by the, developed by the Los Alamos uh, laboratory collaborators, uh, we have been able to increase our original efficiency of 5% to 15%, which was at the time was record breaking. Now, of course, it has been evolved. And uh, moving on, I would like to go into the, the third case uh, of, uh, of how, why, why they, I think uh, the synchrotron radiation is so useful is that we can solve mysteries, but we cannot really see by uh, X-ray diffraction, like conventional X-ray diffraction, uh, but we, we need to use total scattering. And one of the big mysteries that uh, separates uh, halide perovskite from classical semiconductors is that it has two, two very distinctive features that are very characteristic to the halide perovskite, unconventional features. The first one is the huge expansion coefficient, the thermal expansion coefficient that uh, they have. Essentially, it looks like a solid, it is a solid, but it expands as if it were a liquid. Uh, unlike other semiconductors. And uh, the second property is when you change the temperature, the band gap increases uh, as opposed to the classical semiconductors. And uh, these properties uh, are come directly from the, uh, the electronic structure, where the lone pair, this, this uh, pair of sketch have consist of uh, divalent lead, tin, or germanium. And what happens in this case is that this lone pair tries to express itself. It cannot express itself in a perfect cubic symmetry, but it tries to express it. And this is a phenomenon that Mercury can achieve this together with the Simon Billings back in the day when they were working on lead halcogenite materials. We have similar effects. Name this phenomenon emphanescence, the appearance of the lone pair. And we have done a series of experiments also in perovskites with different varieties and using the, uh, the pair distribution function analysis. Uh, we have been able to, to see that there is a second uh, peak, uh, a shoulder on the peak that corresponds to the different distance, uh, the deformation of the octahedron, ferroelectric type, type distortion of the octahedron, that actually signifies that uh, the metal is moving away from the center of the uh, octahedron, even for cubic structure locally. And why this is important, if you look at the electronic structure, the top of the valence band consists of this lone pair. If the, if the lone pair is hybridized and is lost inside the, the bonds, then you have high dispersion, high density of states at the top of the valence band, and you have the, the minimum band. So when you have the lone pair expressed, it's not longer hybridized. Therefore, there is no, this, there is no contribution from this lone pair, and therefore the band gap increases. So this is an explanation of why this is so. And we can also see that different materials can have different deviations. Uh, that was a quite interesting result, that there is uh, so much diversity in how, uh, which perovskite is distorted, distort which not. And uh, the second mystery, and uh, I would like to address is this, uh, what happens when you try to make two-dimensional materials, you, use, you try several cations, suddenly when you use uh, ethyl ammonium, 
what happens is uh, you add, you load the material, you load, 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 nothing happens. The XRD stays the same. It's still a cubic structure, so, but the color changes, the density decreases, importantly, and the morphology changes of the material. So what's going on? And the structure seems to be cubic, nothing, nothing changes. So again, we have to go to, to the PDF analysis. And what we see clearly is that if you look at the lead-lead correlations from the pure material and the loaded material, essentially we see that the lead-lead interactions are lost, meaning most likely that this cation replaces lead uh, to form what we call a disordered hollow perovskite structure. The, the lead is replaced randomly. Uh, and this resembles another example with ethanolamine, uh, which creates an ordered hollow structure where this cation, because of the different charges, creates uh, ordered vacancies in the lattice. And the trends are similar. So I see these two pair of com compounds as, uh, uh, going together, having a similar effect in an order and disorder fashion. And the last uh, thing I would like to assess, to, to discuss, is that we can also use the synchrotron for perovskites using uh, understanding the chemical bonding. Chemical bonding is important. And uh, for us, the, the motivation uh, for this uh, work came from this very interesting work suggesting that a perovskite, which has a formula of cesium-2, tin-4, iodide-6, doesn't contain a tin-4+, but instead contains a tin-2+, with, uh, with iodide having uh, less than minus one charge. And uh, this was, from a chemistry point of view, that was outrageous. So we motivated to do the experiment. And uh, we synthesized the sets of materials with different coordination number and uh, different oxidation states. And we try to understand what, what differences we can have by doing the absorption, uh, the absor actually absorption spectroscopy measurements. And we did so, and we found something that to me was quite surprising. Uh, all the tin 4 compound, tin 4 plus material, the nominal tin 4 plus materials, do shift in the K edge spectra uh, of, of tin. These are the K edge tin uh, spectra. Uh, but uh, the 2 plus oxidation state is not so sensitive to changes in the, the environment. This is bromide, this is iodide, whereas this is from chloride to iodide for tetrahedral and octahedral coordination. And we couple this experiment with uh, theoretical calculation and most power. And uh, what we found is actually that the electronic uh, oxid the oxidation state, so state of the material is not so important. It's still nominally, it's still four plus in, in all cases, clearly, also from most power. But what happens, it's, it's interesting because when you oxidize the tin compound, it's exactly this long pair I was talking before. So you take the electron, the electrons away from the, the valence band, essentially. And when you do so, the electron, uh, the electron distribution around the metal doesn't change, but instead it changes which orbitals contribute more. And therefore, the, when you lose the, electron, uh, the electrons in the oxidized in four plus state, you get more P orbital interaction. And this is possibly the reason that why the, the bonds have become so much shorter. And uh, yeah, with this, I would like to uh, con conclude today's talk. Uh, I, I hope I convinced you that synchrotron experiments are very, very important. Uh, of course, I would like to thank all the collaborators that were contributed to this work. I mean, there are numerous I will to list here, two numerous to list. Uh, but for this uh, today's talk, I would like to really emphasize the importance of uh, this uh, supernatural creatures called beam scientists. And the real help they provide when you are in the facilities on site, they are so knowledgeable, they are very great, great fantastic tutors, teachers, they, they can teach you anything you like. So yeah, as a final statement, I would like to support fully uh, uh, the Greek contribution to ESRF. I think it's very important and we will promote science to the next level in Greece. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Vastupos, for the interesting and nice talk. Uh, so, uh, any questions from uh, the audience? Yes, Professor Vastupos, you can turn on. Okay, so the question is uh, in your case, two materials, 
Are the, the, are the samples still films or you've done uh, what we call lattice engineering? Are they single crystals or they films? Uh, most uh, diffraction experiments and uh, uh, total scattering experiments are used. We use polycrystalline materials. Uh, thin yeah. films. We, we use thin films only in the case of uh, uh, solar cells. We try to uh, emulate the solar cells, and this is when you do the GVAX experiments. We do uh, thin films, but all the other experiments are essentially all polycrystalline materials. Okay. Not so for, for your case, two materials. Mm -hmm. uh, you showed pictures where you basically introduced layers in your lattice. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so your samples are finally uh, bulk materials or thin films, either pandas or, uh, or um, single crystals or thin films. Crystals, crystals. Uh, for the yeah, raw crystals. characterization, these are crystals. Yeah, well, this is how we solve the, no, you, you the crystal the structure. Crystals. You haven't grown thin films, is that correct? Yes, because there is a difficulty. So why do you call them thin films? Uh, no, it, it, this has been done. I mean, this is uh, something that was already probably old. Uh, people are trying to grow films of these materials. Uh, the problem is that they cannot grow them pure. When you grow the crystals, when you control the synthesis, you can make them pure. Okay, but uh, so when you grow the films, it's very difficult to control the composition. So you grew thin films or, cri or, or crystals. And that's what I have to understand because it changes completely the context. Because in, in the case that you grew thin films, it means you've done total scattering on thin films. In case that you haven't grown thin films, it means that you've done total scattering on bulk materials. So I have to understand what you had as a sample. Ah, total, for total scattering, it was a polycrystalline material, powder. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that's powder. So, in, why do you call them thin films? That's, that's the point. Well, the thin films, uh, we, we study thin films when we, are, we care about the okay. device, the photovoltaic device. Okay. So we separate. I mean, we, it could be done. I mean, it's not uh, prohibitive, but uh, it's not something that's not so interesting from, from our point of view. We want to test the device itself. So basically, your aim then was to reduce the dimensionality, is that correct? Yes, give okay. some diversity, some structural diversity to the system, so can you... Okay, uh, yes, I understand. So, just to move on, because we don't have much time, uh, one more quick question. Um, where you had, I think it was case study number three, mm -hmm. uh, where you had, I'm not sure about the numbers, but anyway, uh, where you said that you have a cubic phase which remained cubic, yes, but still, but still, when you've done total scattering, you could find out uh, the, the the local uh, environment. Okay, I don't remember which element. But the question is, how do you know that it remained cubic? Have you done high resolution uh, synchrotron? Uh, no, uh, because, but uh, because because the, the, the diagram that we showed. It, let me go. Yeah, you, you mean this one? Uh, I, uh, this this is the in-house XRD. I mean, uh, it, it's it's. I think it's cubic enough, uh, so so to speak. So. Uh, if you don't do high resolution uh, boundary state diffraction, or even neutron in some cases, uh, you, you, you cannot see the splitting of, this, of the peaks. So you cannot say if the, the sample remains cubic or becomes orthorhombic or even tetragonal. Uh, uh, I'm, what I'm comparing, yeah, I agree. I agree to that. But what, what I'm comparing here is you see this uh, three dimensional structure. No, we, can't, we, can't, we don't see the view graph. So it, ah, sorry about that. So you see the black, uh, the black, uh, the black pattern. No, no, we don't see anything. Um, oh, the, the screen here is a little bit uh, like frozen. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, in the internet is clear. I mean, in the zoom, it's uh, clear. Okay, uh, but that's okay. I remember the uh, the blocks. No, but uh, if you if you look at the the patterns there, uh, they are the same. Essentially the same. Of course, with high, it's not high resolution experiments. We have done high resolution experiments as well, uh, although I'm not showing here. It's not a, when you change the structure uh, to a different symmetry, you you see huge changes. 
and uh, this yeah, is not what we see in this case. Okay. Um, because you know, I'm saying that because we had the same similar problem with other materials, and because the big lines that uh, where we get the total scattering, where, where we can do total scattering, have much lower resolution than the big lines that are dedicated to total scattering to uh, high resolution. So usually we do both uh, experiments to figure out if we have a lowering in the symmetry and then to check. The local oh, we do that too. I mean, we just move the detector close and far, far, far away. I mean, that's uh, that's we we, we do have this. Uh, we do this experiment anyway. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Moscovo. I'm not the professor, but anyway. <laughs> right. So uh, I'm going to chair the next session. Uh, just hold on a second. Yeah. Uh, so, Professor Stubos, thank you very much for the nice talk. Please join me.